we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you willingly went to the cross to take a place of shame, a place of sin, a place of pain. You died our death. You died in our place. You died for us. Lord, we love you. We ask that you will help us to love you more. Even as we engage with your word, please come and help us to draw truth from your word, to draw strength from your word, to draw resources from your word that will help us in our work of Christian discipleship. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Praise the matchless name of Jesus. It's good to be together again in this God's house. I want to add my voice to that of Reverend Lydia to welcome the Wadulos. It's a joy to have you in our midst this morning. They often worship at, is it a saint church in Sironko? St. John's in Sironko, where they live most of the time. But to have you here is a great joy, and we are happy to be in fellowship with you. Also wish to tell uh, this community that we have two teams on mission. One is the Law Love Fellowship. They are in Bukwo, about 52 students there in Bukwo on mission. They went yesterday, and they'll be returning on the 7th. So as you pray in your homes at your times of prayer, remember them that God will use them to bring many people into the kingdom. The other team is Kaim. Kaim traveled also yesterday, and they went to a place called Nyachishenyi, near Chisizi Hospital. They have gone to preach the gospel let us send them our prayers. For them, they are coming back on Tuesday. So we pray that God will use them in the expansion of his kingdom. Our theme today is the reason Christ invites us to face our past and refocus our future. The reason Christ invites us to face our past and refocus our future. The risen Christ invites us to face our past and refocus our future. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 21, a passage which was well read for us. I'll just be reading a few verses as we go along. Because of the length of the passage, I don't have to read it again. The reason Christ invites us to face our past and refocus our future. Those of us who are old enough know about how difficult it is to resolve the past and move on meaningfully and unentangled by particular memories. And these memories come in all kinds of form. It could be something you said that was unkind to another person. It could be not being there when you should have been there and when we are most needed and something went wrong. So you're struggling with that memory. Or what you were caught doing, which you should not have done. Or someone you cheated or denied access to services they deserved. For some people, they wrestle and struggle with the memory of having caused death to another person because of reckless driving. Or it could be betrayal of one you had promised to love unendingly. And it goes on and on. Some things, friends, in the past are really difficult to resolve. In today's message, we will focus on Jesus and how he helps Peter to move on. So in this chapter, John chapter 21, Peter decides to go fishing. 
his friends choose to join him. While some have suggested that he was backsliding from the call the Lord had given him, it could well be that he is just coping with his new normal. Just like many teachers quit their profession of teaching because of the lockdown and now find themselves in other businesses because they have to make ends meet. And so for the disciples, their rhythm of life had changed since Jesus, since the day Jesus had been arrested. Remember that he also, Peter, that is, had a family to feed. Yet it is in this incident of going back to fish that he got a transforming encounter with the risen Lord, resolving his recent past and refocusing his future. And as we look at how Jesus dealt with Peter, we will get a message for each one of us on how to re resolve our past and refocus our future. And we're going to look at two main points. Number one, the reason Jesus sought the disciples out and it was not them who sought the risen Jesus. It is the risen Jesus who sought the disciples out and not the other way round. The second point we will look at is this. We will look at Peter's restoration and the assignment Jesus gave him. Peter's restoration and the assignment Jesus gave him. So we go to the first point. The resurrected Jesus is the one who saw them out and not the other way round. As we read at the beginning of the chapter, it is seven disciples who are named. The prominent one is Peter, and it's possible to miss the other six, but it's actually seven of them who are named in this passage. But verse 1 begins by giving us the big picture of the story. And this is the big picture. That Jesus is revealing himself a third time to his disciples. He's revealing himself a third time to his disciples. And so in verse 1 we read, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. And the story continues. And as you think about what had happened a couple of days before, these questions come to my mind. How do you deal with friends who abandon you at your greatest hour of need? From your point of view, whose responsibility would it be to mend the broken relationship? Jesus, amazingly, in his love and mercy, is the one who takes the initiative. In this passage, it was Jesus who took the initiative. Jesus was there at the shore with the fire, having made breakfast for them. The disciples were cold, fatigued, and frustrated because of a fruitless night. That is, they had caught no fish. They found Jesus waiting as a redeeming waitress. When you are hungry and looking for something to eat, what a joy to find food ready there for you. And the waitress is Jesus himself. But as we engage with this passage, we also note something very powerful. That Jesus performed a miracle that would catch their attention. He performed a miracle that would catch their attention. The kind that they would relate with. Because in their calling, it had been the same miracle that turned them from being fishermen to fishers of men, as we read in Luke chapter 5. So having struggled the whole night and caught nothing, now, by the help of Jesus, they catch 153 big fish. 153 big fish. 
And when John realizes that this is the same man who helped us catch so much fish, John turns to Peter and says, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. And that is when their eyes are open to know who is at the shore. Then Jesus invites them to bring some of the fish, some of the 153, thereby including them in what he was already doing. We also note in this passage that he spoke to Peter after serving him breakfast. He doesn't raise any issue before serving him breakfast. He was not quick to bring up the subject of Peter's recent ugly past, the ugly past of Peter's denial. Similarly, brothers and sisters, Jesus comes to us in our struggles. He wants to open the eyes of our hearts so that we may see him for who he truly is. Peter had overstated his commitment. Jesus is inviting him to rely on God's grace for the journey ahead. It's not how powerful you are. It's not by might nor by power. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not how powerful you are, how gifted you are, how much oil you think you have on your life. It's by the sheer grace of God. Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? But also as we engage in the assignment Jesus gives Peter, we have amazing lessons there. As we think about the assignment, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, we have amazing lessons there. Jesus is aware of Peter's love for him. So now he invites him to share in his ministry of feeding the sheep. We are reminded from the reading of scriptures, in particular John chapter 10, that Jesus is the good shepherd. The good shepherd of the sheep invites Peter and with him, the other disciples, to share in his ministry. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He invites Peter to do what no one can do better than Jesus. If Peter is going to carry out his assignment well, he must learn from Jesus. It is a ministry of compassion. It's a ministry of sacrifice. It's a ministry to be done with truthfulness. And so he tells him, when you are younger, you used to go wherever you wanted. But when you grow up, you'll be taken where you don't want to go. And he's intimating sacrifice for the sake of the ministry he is calling him to. Amazing how the master shepherd invites us, weak and feeble human beings, to join him in the task of shepherding his people. But we also know that he invites one acquainted with weakness. He invites Peter, a man acquainted with weakness. Peter is assigned in spite of his failures and weaknesses. Therefore, as Peter shepherds, he will not do it from the pedestal of moral perfection, but as a justified sinner, as one to whom God's mercy has been extended. Jesus knew all about Peter, but still called him. And again, going back to the Last Supper story, now rendered differently by uh, Luke, Dr. Luke. In chapter 22 and verse 31 to 32, this is what we read. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus is inviting Peter to be part of this ministry as one who is weak, now strengthened by the Lord because he understands how to take care of the weak. He will not do it with pride. He will not do it with a holier-than-thou attitude. He will do it with humility. Peter will know how to strengthen the weak for he himself has exhibited 
weakness. Lastly, we are reminded that the church is Jesus' flock and no one, regardless, can boast of her ownership. Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Tend my lambs. It is the Lord's. It is the Lord's. No minister, no apostle, no bishop, no super apostle can boast of the Lord's church as their church. Sometimes we hear church planters and senior pastors refer to a local congregation as my church. That is wrong. In this ministry, we must always maintain the posture of a steward. It is the Lord's and he invites us to shepherd for him and with him. Jesus alone paid the full price for our redemption with his blood for the purchase of the church. In conclusion, the message we take away is this, that you can be restored regardless of how far you have fallen. Jesus wants you to serve him in spite of your failures. And Jesus has called you to look out for the weak, to help them stand, to help them grow, beginning with the people closest to you. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep, regardless of who you are. Let us pray. By Jesus I love thee, I know thou art mine. My precious Redeemer, my Savior, other if ever I loved thee. Lord Jesus, we hear you ask us this morning, do you love me more than this? And you invite us this morning as a gathered community not to give chorus answers, but to give a personal response to that question. We want to use the words of Peter. Lord, you know that I love you. But we also want to pray in humility that when our love is failing, Lord Jesus, please help us. Help us to love you more than these. Help us to love you above everything and to love you with true commitment. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.